We come to the last talk is uh, Dr. David Green, again, showing the strength of Imperial in the, the world of particulates. And since the questions are now coming towards exposure, and David comes highly recommended in terms of telling us how we should expose or should understand exposure, should I say. Um, yeah, without further ado, we look forward to your talk. Thanks very much. Thank you, Martin. Afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the, uh, the invitation. So, my name's David Green. I, I do a lot of work in measurement. So, I'm here to talk to you about exposure to measurement, uh, exposure to methods in air pollution. Um, so, I'm going to take you on a, on a journey, quite literally, through some of the methods that we use to measure exposure. Uh, here's just one example of where we, we put backpacks on children to understand how they were exposed on their routes to school and at home. So exposure is really just an assessment of risk. Um, sometimes it's compared to uh, occupational exposure, sometimes it's compared to outdoors exposure. It differs from concentration because you can be exposed in, in uh, different environments for different lengths of time. And sometimes you're looking at population exposure, and here's an example of, uh, of work from Imperial where we modelled the concentration across uh, London, as you can see, it's lower on the outside and it's higher on the inside. But you can also measure individual exposure. And here's some recent measurements we made on people working in the London Underground. So one of the, one of the staff uh, works at the gate line and then goes down into the London Underground uh, to look on platforms, make sure everything's okay. And you can see those in red as they move around, they're exposed to more and more. And they do three of those trips a day and the one in blue is just sitting in an office most of the day. And you can integrate that exposure to add it all up, and you can see that the, person, the subject B, who's moving around within the environment, exposed to higher concentrations, overall is exposed to more PM2.5. But it's, a, it's important to understand exposure because we can do something about it. We can induce behavioural change, we can change when we exercise, we can change the routes we take, we can encourage government to change policy and reduce exposure in that way, either in the short term or in the long term. Uh, by notification, and Frank showed some examples earlier, we can encourage people to take medication as well. Now, when we look at an individual's exposure, they're exposed to different, uh, we spend our time in different environments. Most of us spend 80% of our time indoors, and that can be at work or it can be at home, and then we travel. We move through the environment, be that outside, or we can be traveling on the London Underground or in a car. And therefore, we're spending different amounts of time at different concentrations, and that's gonna vary day to day from person to person. So the place where you're spending most of the time is not necessarily uh, representative of your overall exposure. So, if I step through each one of these environments and we'll look at how we measure exposure in each one of these. So when we look at outdoor exposure, we're traditionally looking at measurement networks, like the UK measurement network, a compliance network on the left-hand side. Uh, that's got about a couple of hundred measurement sites in it. And the London network on the right-hand side, about a hundred. Most of them are these great big ugly boxes that sit by the roadside or sit in your park they're very expensive, they can't move around, but they are very accurate, which is great. But it doesn't tell us about what's in between or other environments that we're, that we're in. So recent advancements have included the miniaturization of sensors. So small sensors, they're cheaper, which is great, but they're less accurate. And this is uh, the Breathe London network, which is focused on London. And there are now 300 of these small sensors within that network. We have to do a lot of work to improve the quality of those measurements by comparing them to the reference measurements. Um, we've got co-located sites, etc. And this uh, image here is a screenshot from the recent, one of our recent pollution incidents. And this increased granularity that we have in these measurements means, and 10, by the way, is bad. 10 is as bad as it gets in terms of our, uh, uh, our exposure measurement for the outside world. With this increased granularity, we can watch uh, pollution episodes as they move through the environment as well. And we can't do that quite so well with the larger network, the, with the larger monitors that we have. So if we'd had an animation of this, we would have seen these tens move gradually through as the, 
the long range pollution that was coming from Europe at this time moved from or started to envelop the whole of London. Frank showed earlier uh, a map of, of London. Uh, recently, the, the modeling group have expanded what they're, they're able to do, and they can now get this high, highly spatially resolved measurements of the whole of the UK. And this is NO2 at a 20 meter resolution across the whole of the UK, taking into account every single road, or pretty much every single road in the UK. But this is a model. It allows us to fill in those gaps between the measurements, but it is only a representation of reality. It contains what we know about emissions and we know about activity and produces these fantastic uh, graphics that allow us to assess what we think exposure is like. But it is only a representation. But we can take these models and we can combine them with our measurement networks and we can produce, if you like, a real time, uh, a real time model. And this is what we call the nowcast. And this has been converted into a, a an app that people can look up. And if they want to travel across, this one's uh, sponsored by the City of London. If they want to travel across the City of London, they can go, I'm here, I want to get to there. What's the lowest pollution route I can follow? So by understanding exposure across the environment, we can reduce people's exposure. Uh, the other way to look is from space. Now, satellite observations are great because they tell us what's happening at that time. They're not a model representation. They're also limited by cloud cover and they're also limited by resolution. Um, this is work from Andonkola uh, and this is a consistent global approach. So he can, he can apply this to any place in the world uh, and it shows excellent uh, comparisons with measurement data in the US, but it's at a fairly poor resolution. Uh, you also have to take account of column versus ground-based measurements. So you're looking from space and the distribution of your pollutants within that column that you're looking down on varies, and it varies by time and by location. So you have to take that into account. So that's how we assess outdoor measurements. Um, but of course, we travel from place to place. Uh, and we call these transport microenvironments. And urban travel contributes quite a lot to your daily exposure. There have been a few studies in Barcelona, Houston, uh, and in Canada that show that you're going to, the more time you spend, the higher in, in these environments, the higher your, your, uh, your exposure is. And I think the highest ones we've, we've found in terms of an assessment of daily exposure is from the subway in Canada, up to 20% of your daily exposure from PM2.2, PM2.5 from that travel uh, in Canada. And Canada's not a particularly polluted underground environment, but we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, this graphic here is from some work that we did uh, for the UK rail network. Uh, and we took uh, 100 journeys on different types of trains and we were asked to compare them to what was in the literature about exposure to different air pollutants. So here we've got PM2.5 and you can see that um, if you're traveling in a bus or a car, it's quite high as is cycling, but London Underground was the highest. Um, and these were all quite a lot higher than the long distance travel on on train. Um, when we were considering black carbon and those those little sensors that you saw earlier, the Sadiq Khan was holding, they're very good at measuring trans, uh, as you, measuring as you move through the environment. Uh, you can see here that diesel trains are on a par with some of the other uh, transport uh, methods. So on here, driving was clearly a, a, a mode where you're exposed to high concentrations, and that's principally because you're traveling in the middle of the road uh, and you're very close to the exhaust of the vehicle in front of you. Uh, this is some work uh, from the DEMIS study. Uh, and you, we took here as an example of three people uh, traveling through the environment. Uh, so I think we've got a courier up here, um, a courier and a couple of other people. But generally, as you drive into, London, into the center of London, you're exposed to higher and higher concentration. So the best thing you can do while you're driving around in a polluted environment is keep your windows closed uh, because it's mainly the air from outside coming in. There is a certain amount of self-pollution, mainly that, and uh, you can have the recirculation setting on in your car. But try not to keep it on for too long because the CO2 levels go up and you might fall asleep. 
So if we look at another transport uh, microenvironment, this is the work we did on the London Underground. And here we took these relatively small uh, uh, light scattering instruments and we calibrated them very carefully against reference techniques within the London Underground environment. And I don't know how many of you commute in London, uh, but the Victoria line is not the best. Um, generally, deep lines, so Victoria, Northern, uh, Bakerloo, where there are fewer tunnels, lead to much higher concentrations. And we got, in terms of PM2.5, we got up to nearly a milligram per metre cubed of PM2.5 exposure in some of the, the areas in the middle of the Victoria line. Um, recently, um, New York have just published that some areas of New York are even higher than this. So I'm going to have to redo this study. But generally, London Underground suffers because it's very old, it's very deep, and there's a long distance between tunnel areas. So if you consider the, the circle line, it's in and out of tunnels all the time, so it's fairly well ventilated. Of course, um, PM2.5 in these locations is dominated by the wear from brakes or from wheels and rails. Another study we're doing on the London Underground is to look at, uh, it's a panel study, and we're looking at exposure of COPD patients and volunteers on a journey on the London Underground and on the London Overground. Uh, and this is particularly challenging because in the previous study, I, I calibrated my sensors to London Underground dust because I knew what they were exposed to all the time. However, in this study, we're moving between different environments. And that's very challenging for a PM measurement that's moving. So, uh, and the other aspect is because we're moving inside and outside, you have to consider pollutants that are also of concern outside. So we need to monitor NO2 and we need to monitor ozone as well. Uh, the other thing we're monitoring is sound. If anybody's traveled on the London Underground, you can't hear each other speak at some points. So we're trying to account for sound and you can see our participants are also wearing noise cancelling headphones. So we developed this, uh, this measurement system here, which is a, a portable trolley. Uh, so it's on wheels, it weighs about 35 kilos. So it's not, you don't want to drag it around with you all day, but you can certainly get it on and off of a transport environment. Uh, and here we've got an NO2 instrument. We've got a psi spectrometer. So that gives us very small particles up to very large ones. And then ozone, and we're also collecting filters as well. So if we take you on a little journey, we go from Willesden Junction here in the kind of north of London, and we enter a tunnel and concentrations go up uh, well, to several hundred uh, micrograms per meter cubed of PM2.5. And then we get to Elephant and Castle. And you can see how inversely correlated this is with NO2. So here we are, low concentrations of PM2.5, high concentrations of NO2. And when we get to Elephant and Castle, NO2 goes up, PM2.5 comes down, and then we return to the return journey as well. The other environment uh, we looked at, or was, it, was in the original slide, is indoor air pollution. Now we spend, as I said, about 80% of our time indoors. And if we consider the PM2.5 concentrations indoors, it's affected by sources outdoors coming in and sources indoors. So again, it's a very complex environment with mixed sources. So outdoors, we've got air pollution coming in. And then indoors, we've got sources from cooking, from smoking, if you've got a wood stove, uh, if you're cleaning, all of these can increase PM2.5 concentrations indoors. Um, and that's just PM2.5. There are other different sources for different air pollutants. So it's a very complex environment that we're studying in a lot more detail now. Uh, this is a graphic for the NERC Well Home study, and we're taking um, these small sensors here, again carefully calibrated and putting them into 100 homes and doing that twice to look at seasonal variability. Um, and we're also putting deposition plates in to look at biological aerosols, microplastics, some uh, emerging chemical contaminants that you might see from cleaning products, uh, and then we're comparing them to outdoors as well. So this is going to be going on over the next two or three years to look at um, indoors versus outdoors air. Some uh, very brief um, example data. This is actually my house where we were testing. Um, and you can see that uh, generally PM2.5 concentrations are really driven by these uh, weekday 
uh, evening cooking events. So a quick stir fry on a weekday evening means that concentrations in the weekday are much, much higher than they are at the weekend. Uh, it's also interesting we have measurements in the bedroom, the kitchen and the lounge. And as soon as you start cooking within, well, literally tens of minutes, the concentrations through the entire house are approaching what they are in the kitchen. So we've got measurements from lots of different locations. And how do we then integrate these into a single exposure? This is a work, again, work from the modeling team. And this takes the London Travel Demand Survey, which uh, is interviews from thousands of people in London and how they move through the London environment. So you can understand by taking uh, where they are, outdoors, uh, whether they're driving, whether they're on the London Underground, you can integrate that exposure to give you a better exposure assessment than you would just by looking at one of those outdoor air pollution monitors, which is the usual way of doing it. What you get is a very uh, different exposure from the, uh, from the LHEM, so London Hybrid Exposure Model, than you would normally. So finishing up with a few um, challenges and opportunities. There are real opportunities going forward, as you saw with the Breathe London Network, Improvements of measurement technology mean we can miniaturize or we can transport, which is great. There's higher spatial resolution coming from satellite technology. So that can be good to augment what we have already in terms of modeling capability. Um, and there's greater spatial and temporal modeling resolution available coming for indoor and transport environments. And the, what I just showed you previously is a really good example of by bringing together these hybrid approaches from outdoors and indoors, we can much better assess um, people's true exposure. There are challenges. There are further chemical components out there that are emerging that we don't know anything about because we don't measure or they're just being brought into the environment. These include, include domestic cleaning products or microplastics. We don't know enough about these. They're also changing, changing emissions over time. Uh, we've got net zero. We've got non-exhaust versus exhaust, which we've talked about. So we've got to continue understanding these. And we also need to identify the most toxic components. But ever so quickly, um, we're all still struggling with understanding how the different sources of pollution and their chemical composition affect toxicity. And this is the most recent statement from Comiap, with various people in the audience, saying we still, it's likely that they are more toxic, but we still don't have the health evidence. So how are we going to get that health evidence? We are starting, we're looking at uh, exposure to different properties of PM using even larger measurement uh, facilities. This is from uh, the super sites program around the UK. So we've got big super sites in Manchester, in Birmingham and in London, both at the background here and at the roadside. And this is the sort of information it can give us. With these high time resolution chemical composition measurements, we can start to break apart what we understand just as PM 2.5 mass into detailed chemical composition understand those organic components uh, and others like non-exhaust and exhaust that are going to actually link uh, chemical composition to toxicity. Uh, okay, thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much David, perfectly on time. Good. Let's keep on checking your work. <laughs> um, questions? Roger. That was fantastic, thank you. Um, I think it's really interesting, you kind of just answered a bit of the question at the end there in terms of now understanding what the proportionment is. Mm -hmm. the, the underground study was really interesting. Are you able to do that in that scenario to understand what, you know, what's making up that PM2.5A and then B? The exposures, you know, at certain times are up into the hundreds of micrograms, you know, and that's, that's interesting. But what, in terms of the drivers, these could, I mean, what sort of do you, do you know what exposure they're getting? The drivers, uh, yes, we're doing some of that, that measurement anyway. We've done lots of the chemical composition measurement previously. So we've had static measurements on Hampstead Tube Station measuring the chemical composition um, at four. In fact, these, this one here, you've got four up because that's, that's a four hour sample. So that horrible black filter has only been on for four hours. And then we take that away, we've done the chemical composition. Uh, so we've done that. We are measuring driver exposure. We're measuring the exposure of people who are at the gate line, in the office, at the station. 
That's why these results have misled a lot of people. Um, I heard gasp when he said milligrams per cubic meter of PM2.5. That's because people think PM2.5 nanograms is the same as carbon. Hmm? I can tell them from someone who had a heart attack walking along the notorious street 25 years ago that I go on the underground. Because there are no, virtually no combustion particles. Mm, no. There are lots of particles, combustion particles, I think, because of the causes of the heart attack. Um, so, in those gra that graph, for example, yep. MO2, it's measuring particle numbers. That's not measuring particle numbers. No, it, it, it is. MO2 is a. It, mm. is a your way of ah, so so this instrument here uh, is a size spectrometer. So that measures particle number between ah, ten so nanometers yeah, up numbers. to thirty yeah, odd. Particle numbers down underground, we measure. Mm. They're, they're very low. Yeah, in relative to. Uh, and but, in drivers, PM drivers, you will find that we did. Mm -hmm. um, Numbers go up when they go above ground and they go down when they go mm. underground and so on. Just like nitrogen dioxide. Yeah. So this is these are the first measurements I've seen of nitrogen dioxide in an underground environment. Yeah. And actually it, a li, and it's by a very high spec method as well. So and this this is fully calibratable and, and comparable to the reference measurements. And these are actually higher than we expected. So there's there's obviously quite a bit of outside air coming into Polluted outside air coming into the underground. And with that nitrogen dioxide would also come some of those fine particles as well. But likely to be more similar to what you would get at a background site. And then on top of that, you're getting everything else that is coming from the rail yeah. wear and, and the wheel wear and everything. Else. They don't ventilate. They it's just pushed. They just push the air around. So when they come mm. from outside, they push the quantum of yeah. air around the sun to form that. But the, the, the material um, underground is straight. It's very scales, different. Yep. That sort of thing. Yep. It's mostly down on the ground. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's big hot. So it's not the, it's just not the same thing. No, I didn't say it was. No, it's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very different, and we're still. People understand. Mm. I heard the guards behind me. I'd reassure that. Person. <laughs> Yep. On that note, we'll Fantastic. let you off the hook. <laughs> Thank, Thank you.